After Teresa Davidson Murphy dropped her daughter Jessica off for a weekend volleyball tournament on October 7th, 1999, she returned to her home near Rainier, Oregon. When Jessica's stepfather showed up a week late to pick her up instead, Jessica knew something horrible had happened to her mother. What happened that weekend, and why was the family gun missing? Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic, Tim. I hope everyone out there is doing well. How are you? That's the real question. (laughs) I am doing well. And uh, Lance, this is the second part of a two-part episode. It's about the mysterious disappearance of Teresa Ann Davidson Murphy. And this case was submitted to us through private investigations for the missing by Teresa's daughter, Jessica. And there was a part one that we released last week. So if you haven't heard that yet, please make sure to listen to that. But in this conversation, we will cut to an interview that Jennifer had with Teresa's mom, Yvonne. And Teresa Ann Davidson Murphy went missing from Rainier, Oregon on October 7th, 1999. Anyone with information on the disappearance of Teresa Ann Davidson Murphy, you are asked to contact the Oregon State Police Department at 503-731-3020, and the detective in charge is Tracy Clark, and the case number is 003 And again, big thanks to the Vanished podcast and the Grim Truth podcast and our researchers at Private Investigations for the Missing who took all the publicly available information, and with Jennifer's interview, that is how we have these two episodes. And not to make this intro super long, Tim, so I'll just instruct people to listen to the first episode on Teresa Ann Davidson and uh, what we say about all that information out there and how it's not really our intent to double up on any of it. And a lighter note, Tim, what are you doing at the end of April, beginning of May for about three days, several thousand miles away? Viva Las Vegas, Lance. We're going to CrimeCon. It is going to be a blast. Um, Join us in Las Vegas at CrimeCon and use promo code CRAWLSPACE at CrimeCon.com for 10% off your standard badge. I can imagine being at home and thinking to myself, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm going to CrimeCon this year. I'm a big fan of it all. I love the podcasters. I love the all the exhibits and, and all of the speaking engagements that they have, but I'm just not sure. Well, 10% should be really what tips you over the edge there, puts you over the other side of the fence. Yeah, that was us last year, Lance. We, mm-hmm. we sat it out, and uh, I'll tell you, I was feeling some real FOMO over it. Um, and uh, seeing those pictures, and I really wanted to be there. So we're going to be there this year, and I can't wait to see everyone again. All right, well, hopefully we see everyone there, especially John Lorden. And please follow us on social media at Missing CSM. Thanks a lot for listening. Welcome back. Again, this is part two. Make sure to listen to part one. There's some information in there that we will not be covering here in part two. Throughout this episode, we will play clips from Jennifer Amell's interview with Yvonne. Yvonne is Teresa Davidson's mom, and Jessica is Teresa's daughter. Teresa's husband at the time of her disappearance was a man named Richard Murphy, and that is who Yvonne is talking about in this first clip. And then after she went missing, I called and wanted to talk to Jessica, Mm -hmm. and he wouldn't let me talk to her. I called twice, and uh, he wouldn't let me talk to her. He called her father, and in the middle of the night, had her father come and pick her up. In the middle of the night? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't trust Richard if far as I could throw him. 
So before Jessica went to live with her dad, she asked to take some of her mom's belongings with her. And Richard told her that she couldn't, that he wanted to keep everything in the house in case Teresa came back. Yvonne also asked Richard to return some of Teresa's items later on, and he wouldn't allow that either. And it was later learned that he took all of Teresa's things to a storage locker, then failed to pay the rent, and the locker was auctioned off, and all of Teresa's belongings are now gone. This is just, like, really sad to me. I mean, her kids and her mother are left behind, like, wondering what happened to Teresa, and they don't even have, like, anything to remember her by you know like objects are important in that in in these cases don't you think 100 percent. there could also be clues there that he clues just there, conveniently too. washed away it's like laundering money or something yeah oh yeah. that's a great point yeah it's, it's like laundering evidence how long do you think just getting your opinions here how long do you think it would take for uh missed rent payments on a storage unit before there, it's auctioned off three months probably I think you get no- late notices and like a warning probably at three months. And I think it might be six months before they actually go to that drastic measure of auctioning it. Yeah. Okay. So because then they have to plan the auction. People have to, you know, plan to show up and everything. So it takes some time yeah. there. So yeah, let's let's say six months. Let's say anywhere between four and six months. Where is this investigation at? Is no one asked to see belongings of hers and, and no one... No one has alerted uh, law enforcement that all of her stuff is in the storage unit. Did he keep it a secret? That's that's a really good point. I I mean, we know law enforcement went to the house and confiscated a few things of Teresa's, like her computer. And I think it was mentioned some albums were taken, but I don't know why that would be. You know, the detective said that they've been there a couple of times and he is, Richard has just said, you know, you come again and I will call in a, a report or whatever it is that they do. He says, I know my rights. Yeah, they ran a search on, on the property, which sounded like a pretty good search. Um, but yeah, there's kind of no excuse for why these belongings would be lost like that. Right. Obviously, Richard never told them that he moved them to a storage locker. There was probably no communication um, during those months, is my guess as well. Not that Richard probably would have offered that information, though. Right. And he 100 percent. My I guess my other point was that he definitely didn't tell anybody that all of the stuff was in there. This is probably discovered well after the fact. He certainly didn't tell his 13 year old daughter. Yeah, seems pretty intentional. I had read that Richard had put Teresa's belonging in storage. Well, to begin with, he said he told the police that he put it, her things in a shed that was behind the house. Then he said he put it in storage. Mm -hmm. And then the story came out that he couldn't afford the storage, so it went up for auction. And that's the last I've heard. Is there any confirmation that he purchased storage? Nope. Hmm. Not that I know of. It actually wasn't until September 10th of 1999, which was two months after Teresa's disappearance, that her disappearance was written about in a local newspaper called the Longview Daily. It's reported that she left conflicting information as to where she was going. And it doesn't state where this information came from, but according to Jessica, Yvonne, and Chris, Richard was providing information to the police and the press that was actually opposite of what they knew of Teresa. Um, He told the press that Teresa had been doing drugs and had gone missing before. Nowhere else from from this research have we uh, learned that Teresa was doing any drugs other than from what Richard said. So I would I would put that as highly suspicious as well. Um, He told Teresa's daughter that she was doing drugs. He told the media and possibly the police. And maybe that's our answer in why the police maybe didn't uh, do as thorough as of a job as they could have because Richard tainted the well and told them she was a drug addict. Not that that's okay to not work on a drug addict missing persons case, but as a co-host of this show, we know that that's a reality, that that happens. Oh, yeah, and it definitely colors the perception of the public, too. Like, unfortunately, they care less about people who, like, have a record or use drugs or are involved in sex work or anything like that. Um, everybody's waiting for, again, that perfect victim. We've talked about this so many times. 
So for Richard to be kind of poisoning the well and characterizing Teresa in this way seems like a very kind of planned move in a way. Would you guys agree? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah, hundred mm-hmm. percent. That that he would be the one that's controlling not only the inner circle of the family, but he's now controlling what is uh, being communicated to law enforcement and the press. I mean, two months later, two months later, getting a uh, getting uh, the press coverage only to say that she had gone missing before and she was a drug user. There's no reason to put that out there two months later if it was true. And Richard's grandfather was also telling people that Teresa had gone missing before, that she had spent a year in Big Sur and her daughter didn't know where she was. And that's the quote. And it is believed that this led police to take Teresa's case not as seriously as as they could have. Although detectives did say that they were unable to gather any information that substantiated Teresa going missing previously. So what it seems like happened is Richard told his grandfather some lie about Teresa having gone missing previously to alleviate suspicion on him. And then Richard's grandfather was spreading that false rumor around town. Mm -hmm. Is this the first time we've heard of Richard's grandfather? Did I miss something? Well, Richard's grandfather bought this property, like this 10, 10 acre property that um, Richard had his mobile home on, which Teresa lived on. So I imagine, I think like his grandfather also lived on that property too. So this guy would be like involved in their lives. I imagine. See, his grandparents used to live below him and they both passed away and he had three kids. One, uh, one of the, the oldest boy was a step son and the other two they will not have nothing to do with Richard did oh. his grandparents live there at the time of Teresa's disappearance yes they did mm-hmm. and have you ever spoken to them not since she had disappeared no I did when I went up there one time to visit and did they hear anything or seeing it see anything well there was conflicting stories on that hmm. Richard told the police department that, or the detective, that they seen a white car, and then his story changed that she went someplace or met somebody, and I mean, it. every time something was said, his grandparents said his stories changed. That, like the detective said, we all know that he either did something or he knows something, but we have to prove it. Since then, with those last two detectives that's been on the case, it, it's like it's closed as far as they're concerned. But this is a good point to to mention a little bit of background on Richard Murphy. He was born in St. Helens, Oregon, not far from Rainier. And Rainier is actually a really small town. In 2000, it had a population of about 1,600, according to the U.S. Census. And Richard still lives on this property where Teresa went missing. Um, He was six years younger than Teresa. And according to Yvonne, Richard's family is pretty well known in Rainier and that all of his relatives live there. So if his grandfather didn't live on the property that he owned, he definitely lived nearby. And Richard's maternal grandfather brought his family there in 1969, a couple years before Richard was born. And Richard was married previously. He has three sons from that marriage. And Yvonne stated that she babysat them when she'd visit Teresa in the summers and claims that there was domestic violence in Richard's previous marriage. Yeah, we're not really sure where his boys were during the time that Richard and Teresa were living together in Rainier. They may have been with their mother. And this violence is why Jessica said her brother moved back in with her father uh, because Richard was very violent with him and she remembers him throwing her brother against a wall once and Jessica said she wasn't assaulted by Richard herself but it was her brother that Richard took out his uh, aggression on. And Richard had also not been paying his child support for his sons and at one point owed more than $25,000 and Teresa was financially supporting Richard by helping him buy equipment for his business. And Jen, did you check out Richard's record? Yeah, I did look it up. He was a convicted felon. Um, Back in 1990, he was convicted uh, for a felony forgery charge, which he served time for. Um, And then in 2002, 
keep in mind this is after Teresa's disappearance. He was actually convicted of criminal mistreatment one, assault in the third degree, and criminal mistreatment in the first degree. And Richard filed for divorce from Teresa on September 13th, 2002. And uh, it appears the action was dismissed in January of 2003 for lack of proof of publication. And a little bit of research um, looking up proof of publication. Apparently, if you cannot find your spouse, you can request permission from the court to publish a notice of the divorce in the newspaper or post a notice in the courthouse. And that's called a motion to serve by publication or posting. Which apparently he never did. Right. So the motion to obtain the divorce was dismissed? Yeah, I'm not sure at this point if they're still legally married. It seems like they might be. So Richard apparently has an alibi. This is his story. So Richard allegedly left on Thursday, October 7th, 1999 to go camping alone at that Brown Creek campground. And this was on the Olympic Peninsula. He did not answer the phone at the house for Jessica until the next weekend. So he may have had 10 or so days to himself. This campground is 118 miles away from the town of Rainier, which, as we mentioned before, is about two hours due north. But the question is, why did Richard choose this place to camp alone? He may have gone there before. Or maybe it's just a place he liked to go, of course. Um, but the Brown Creek campground is used for hiking and biking and fishing and hunting. However, the campground closes in late September and all of the um, amenities that you might use during camping, running water, electricity, that sort of stuff. These are closed in September and are behind a locked gate, but there's plenty of dry camping in that area. And dry camping is just, you know, camping with whatever you brought with you. There's no amenities. So either he just went dry camping in this random campground for at least three days, or it's totally untrue that he went to this campground because it was kind of closed. And it appears that the weather was warm for October uh, in the upper 50s during the day, obviously some cooler nights. It rained quite a bit on Friday, just under three inches, which might have caused some flooding in that area. Yeah, it doesn't seem uh, very nice to camp in the rain. If it were me, I mean, he would have left Thursday, right, according to his own story. So he would have been yeah. there. And then Friday, it starts downpouring. Wouldn't you just kind of pack up and go? I think I'd probably pack up and go at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Further details about the Brown Creek campground is uh, hunting at that time would have been a muzzle loader for elk, which ended the day before, right? October 8th or any weapon for bear. So muzzle loader for elk ended on the 8th, as well as any weapon to use for bear. It would also be grouse season. Modern firearm for deer didn't start until after Richard would have returned. If he was fishing, there's still salmon and steelhead in the creek at the time. Um, but we don't know if Richard was, in fact, a hunter fisherman. But we do know that at that time, he was not allowed to possess firearms. Due to his felony conviction? Yeah. Yes. But he's not restricted from muzzle loaders. Now, if someone here can educate me on what, in fact, a muzzle loader is, all I'm picturing is what people use to defend their land during the Revolutionary War. I mean, that's kind of accurate. A, uh, a muzzle loader is a type of weapon where you would load the bullet or the projectile into the muzzle instead of into the chamber or the clip. But if Richard was either hunting or fishing, he would have had to have gotten a non-resident license to do so. Because remember, he's coming from out of state. And that's considerably more expensive than getting a license in his own state. And that would also mean that there'd be a record in his name if he did obtain a license. But obviously, I'm sure everyone who goes hunting or fishing doesn't uh, obtain a, a license in the above board way. Oh, that's probably true. But if he was going into a campground that allowed hunting and fishing, you better believe there's like park rangers there, there's fishing game there, and someone with his criminal past, risking for no reason getting caught without a hunting license, that's that's big trouble. That's big fines for him. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I imagine like people hunt without licenses if they're on their own property or something like sure. that. But like, I don't know. I think you're right, Lance. 
and out of season for some of these. It would be really hard to get away with it. And not to mention the area where Richard lived is much better for fishing and hunting. So it doesn't even make sense that he would risk all of that to travel two hours north, pay a higher license fee if he was going to get a license or travel two hours north to risk getting caught when he could simply do it on his property. Yeah, good points. And so that brings us to the present, really. And um, Jessica, Teresa's daughter, runs a Facebook page dedicated to her mother. It's called Help Find Teresa Davidson. And she's very active and vocal about what happened to her mom. She believes that Richard either had something to do with her disappearance or knows what happened. Can't really blame her for feeling that way. Do you know if the police ever actually considered Richard a person of interest? Oh, yeah. They did, Oh, actually. yeah. Yeah, uh, but like that one detective said, he says, we really, he says, we could go to court. He says, but if they found him innocent, we would never be able to go back to court, you know, and try him for the same thing. Right. And we don't really have the actual proof yet. Now, unfortunately, Teresa's house in Puyallup went into foreclosure after the payments had stopped, after she went missing in October of 1999, Yvonne and Jessica both talk about how close Jessica was to her mother, and that they're inseparable, and that Teresa would never just walk away from her daughter, would never just walk away from paying the mortgage on her home. And the speculation, considering Chris's conversation that week with Teresa, was that she was planning to leave Richard that weekend when he was away camping. So, I mean, we use that word speculation, but... It could very well be if she's speaking in hushed tones to Chris about something concerning Richard. Richard's violent. Yeah, I don't think she like explicitly stated to Chris, her stepbrother, that she had planned on leaving. But he was kind of reading between the lines on that, I imagine. And maybe that's why she wanted to meet up with him in person to like kind of make plans. And potentially she wanted to go stay with Chris, too. I mean, this is a dangerous time if a if you're planning to leave your abusive husband. But a perfect time if you plan on leaving him when he says he's going camping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. I don't know if Richard remarried or he was just living with this girl. But they were living together and... It was shortly after Jess or uh, Terry went missing, and then I don't know how long after that that she left him. And the police told me that they thought it would be a good time to try to question her. And when they got an appointment to do so, she had gone back to him, and she wouldn't say anything that time. Was that a few years ago, or is that recently? Uh, No, it was a few years ago. Jessica states that about a month to six weeks after Teresa went missing, that Richard had a new girlfriend. And Yvonne believes they eventually got married and then were separated for a while. A detective told Yvonne that now would be a good time to contact this woman for information. And apparently the detective tried to get information from her, but the woman seemed afraid of Richard. And she eventually reconciled with him and didn't return the detective's calls. I would love for this woman to come to her senses and talk to Jessica's family. That's unfortunate. Exactly. And this was still 22, 23 years ago. If this was only six weeks after Teresa went missing, he has a new girlfriend. Uh, Is she still with him? I don't know how long after they separated. I don't know how long after they got back together. But I think where it where it stands now is that she is not talking to law enforcement. And there's a report about the gun. There's a gun. What's going on there? Well, a gun matching the description of Teresa's was found by a fisherman on the Columbia River near Rainier. But it was quite corroded, and police said that they were unable to determine a serial number. Yeah, our um, our researcher here, Kathleen, noted that it might be actually kind of easy to remove the corrosion i i don't know what type of corrosion was on this gun but if it's like rust and that sort of stuff you can definitely remove that with like baking soda or something and manage to get the serial number off of it also i think you can also do a rubbing can you not like you put a piece of paper on it and then rub it with a crown or something 
I feel like there would be ways unless it was filed off, you know? I feel like there would be ways that the police could do it. I mean, yeah. you and I might be able to figure it out with baking soda <laughs> or doing a rubbing with like a, like lead pencils. But I mean, if it's in law enforcement's hands, I, I would hope that they would figure out a way. I mean, any gun, not just in the case of Teresa's disappearance, but any gun that's found, you should you know, be motivated enough to get the serial number to figure out whose it is and why it's there. Yeah, I mean, maybe they have. Yeah. 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 Maybe they did get it, and they, I mean, they have no reason, maybe, to tell uh, the family. Um, but it does say that they they said they were unable to get the serial number, so that would be that would be a lie, I guess, if that's true, and uh, not supposed to happen from law enforcement to the family. But um, who knows? Uh, we've heard stories, but I, I would assume they probably did get it. I think. I mean, they should have. Yeah, that's true. And this brings us to the most interesting piece of information in this case. There was an anonymous witness. And this witness, this man claims he heard from Richard's relatives. He knew Richard from growing up as well as seeing him as an adult because I guess they both lived in and around Rainier. And he describes Richard as sneaky and a drug and alcohol addict. The story is that Richard got wind of Teresa leaving him, came back, and confronted Teresa by blocking her truck in with his van at the bottom of the driveway. So apparently um, the neighbors of Richard's, who were also relatives of Richard, heard yelling during this time. And according to this story, Richard started physically attacking Teresa, so she went back to her truck to get her gun. Richard got it away from her, and she ran, and then Richard shot her in the back. He loaded her up in the van and buried her on the property. And this is all taken from a verbal statement from the Grim Truth podcast. Um, This is quite a a story, guys, huh? It is. Yeah, I mean, there's even the other account that Teresa's family was told of. Uh, Someone said that Richard said to a neighbor that he had a backhoe. And he had pulled a tree up and said, you could hide a body under here and no one would know. Yeah, we learned about this type of thing when we were discussing the Archer Ray Johnson case. And this was also out of Washington. So similar area. Apparently, this is called stumping. Stumping. Remember that? Yep. Yeah. Pulling a tree up, tossing the body under, and then repositioning the tree. So this is really interesting, right? So I wonder if the uh, the neighbors there could corroborate this um, this rumor, I guess, right? If they are the ones who heard the yelling, I guess they, they would be witnesses technically to some altercation on one of those days. Um, but it sounds like that information hasn't made it to the public, at least, other than in this rumor. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's difficult, too, if his neighbors are actually related to him, too, because they would have, you know, it would be an awkward thing to rat on your relative, you know? Um, but I imagine like if you did hear these things, you're maybe talking about it potentially rather than going to the police. I don't know. And finally, speaking of the police, on August 7th, 2001, in the Longview Daily News, Detective Hirschman stated that he believes Teresa most likely met with foul play. Richard has never officially been named a person of interest or a suspect, however. We'll name him an unofficial uh, person of interest here on uh, on the missing show. I will say it's true that he is an interesting person in regards to Teresa's disappearance. So this story, let's unpack this for a second here. So the story is that Richard found out that Teresa was going to leave him. And so she got in her car and she drove down that long driveway and he blocked her in at the end of the driveway with his van so she couldn't get out. Right. Right. So the the part of her leaving Richard is kind of corroborated by Chris, right? That that she was at least going to talk to him about maybe leaving this uh, maybe violent or abusive relationship. We don't really know. But so that's kind of corroborated. And then the the vehicle having moved from the front of the driveway sort of tracks with this rumor as well. And what we know Jessica said she saw of the vehicle. Just back that up a little bit. And we also know based on Richard's previous convictions and the behavior he had towards his son, where he was very abusive, he's got a violent past. Although Jessica stated that she didn't see him abuse her mom, but you're talking about somebody with a streak of violence. It was only a matter of time, given his violent history. Yeah. 
And then the also thing that tracks in this story is that they heard a gunshot. And we also have a gun involved in uh, the story because I'm not sure if their neighbors were aware, if anybody was aware that Richard had reported his own gun missing. Or was it the gun owned by Teresa? They would have had to have been looking at it because even, even if they heard a gunshot, they wouldn't have known where she was shot. Right. So you're saying the detail of her being shot in the back is obviously more detailed than where a neighbor from a, a house certain yards away probably could see. Mm-hmm. Although within hearing distance of, of some yells, apparently, if this rumor is uh, true. Yeah. Yeah. So you hear you're hearing yells and, and you look out and you see this, you would have to see her getting shot in the back. Yeah, unless Richard confessed to somebody. Yeah. Well, there's enough here in this rumor that make, that does make it interesting. You know, there's enough from the story that we know already that, that makes it um, certainly possible. Yeah, and we do know that law enforcement searched this property. I mean, it's an expansive property, so I don't know if they searched the whole 10 acres or anything like that. But they did have dogs. Yeah, so I, I imagine it's possible that dogs could have missed a body. Yeah, I wonder where the van is now, and did they check for blood in the van? As far as I know, there is no forensic testing done on the van. And we get another clip from Jen speaking with Yvonne. Jeff has had t-shirts uh, made up with her picture on it, and then the poster or that uh, the poster that was sent out, and then on her vehicle, it's right across the back window. Please help me find, you know, Teresa Ann Davidson. Murphy, and it's been, you know, in the Oregonian, the first year she was missing, the newspaper, two two of the newspapers, and it's just supposedly all over the United States. I don't know for sure that that's what was told to me. That The one detective that's on the case now, I mean, she's either never in the office or maybe a month or so she might call you back. We just told her, you know, it'd be nice if you just called and said, no, there's no news or anything like that. But both of us have been told the file's there, but unless somebody comes in and says, oh, I know something, nothing's being done. Are you guys seeing any results from this media attention? Have the police ever no. talked to you about it? No. Nope. In fact, when they do call the police department, they said that they can't give out any information because it's an ongoing case. She's got other cases. You know, I realize that uh, Teresa isn't the only missing person. She could do better, a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, and she could at least make you guys feel as if she's actually working on it and and cares. Right, exactly, Mm -hmm. yeah. Or, like I said, uh, uh, the couple of detectives about three or four years ago, he would. I mean, he would call you. He would tell us there was no news or there might be something, but we can't say anything. You know, he would more or less kind of fill you in on, you know, whatever. This last two detectives, especially this one, Tracy, uh, nothing, absolutely nothing. It really makes me upset. And this case reminds me of uh, this book, In Control, Dangerous Relationships and How They End in Murder by uh, our friend Jane Moncton Smith, Lance. We spoke with her on this show um, in 2021, and uh, I I believe we also aired that episode on Crawl Space as well. Um, Important work that she does. Check out that book. A lot of the the same sort of markers of control and isolation are... um, you know, written about in that book. And, and it, it's a pattern that people like this follow. And I know it yeah. doesn't do us any good right now, but um, it reminded me of the book. But what it does do is get the word out there. And after all of this time, perhaps some people are more comfortable coming forward. Perhaps more interviews can be had. We would love to have more people on these airwaves to talk about Teresa, to talk about the disappearance and maybe shake some stuff up. I mean, that would really be uh, what could be done at this time. And you brought out that book and and it all talks about what to recognize in the moment. 
uh, of these escalating, these violent escalating um, relationships. But we're 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 twenty three years removed from this one. All we can do is say, if anyone has any information, you can contact the Oregon State Police, 503-731-3020, and that's Detective Tracy Clark that's on uh, Teresa's case. And we can put put it out there, and hopefully other people who are in relationships like this can identify some of these uh, red flags. Yeah, I think that's um, that's something our listeners can possibly take away from this if they find themselves in a dangerous or controlling relationship. Make sure to be very careful if you are trying to leave that relationship, because Jen, I believe you noted this is the most uh, that that is the most dangerous time um, is when a woman tries to leave that relationship. Yeah, most definitely. I just want to end by saying how strong Jessica is in revisiting this part of her life, because. This is a difficult thing to do. I mean, it's a it's a it's a terrible thing to not have any answers about where your mother has gone. Um, but she's doing her best to try to raise awareness for this case. Um, she's very active on the, her Facebook page, and I hope that 2022 is the year for some answers for Jessica and her family. I'm wondering what closure might look like for you in terms of Teresa. I would say peace. It would it would bring a lot of peace. Uh, you know, if she would contact anybody, it would be Jessica. Uh, nothing, absolutely nothing. No activity on her bank account, savings account, nothing. Like I said, it would be closure to where, you know, it would. It'd be another chapter that's that'll close for me. And I imagine for Jeff too.